good afternoon, everybody. So let us start our monthly seminar at Senan Words, the colloquium of Senano. So today our guest is Professor Eric Anglahit. He's a professor in the material science uh, at University of uh, Université de Montpellier in France, deputy director for the International at Polytech Montpellier. So his research is mainly focused on the use of uh, characteristic techniques to unveil the structure and properties of nanomaterials, and he's particularly interested in carbon nanomaterials, such as carbon nanotubes. And today he's going to give a talk about this subject entitled The Near Infrared Spectroscopy Studies of Single Walled Carbon Nanotubes. So let's welcome Professor Eric Anglahit. So thank you very much for joining us. And you can introduce yourself and start the talk. Thank you very much, André. Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you at distance. It was a long time I didn't make a conference at distance. You know, you might need some special time, but still really nice to have the opportunity to present you our work. So, as André said, we will talk about single wall nanotubes. We will talk about the properties that they have to emit light, and they emit light in a special spectral range. This is the near infrared. We will show how um, the excitonic properties of nanotubes, these excitons, these electron hole pairs, which are actually responsible of the light emission from the nanotubes. Thanks to these excitonic properties, the spectroscopy, the optical spectroscopy of nanotubes will allow us to investigate the dielectric environment of the nanotubes. So I will first introduce the nanotubes, the optical properties, the excitonic properties. Then I will give a few examples from the literature first and from our group of how we can investigate the dielectric environment of single nanotubes through uh, photoluminescence uh, measurements. So I will present a couple at the end of the talk, I will present a couple of examples of what we do in our lab. So these are the, the PhD works of four of our PhD students. First, that of Camilo Zamora, who ex investigated uh, with the in photoluminescent spectroscopy, the dispersion of nanotubes in various kinds of complex fluids, including liquid crystals uh, and Sus uh, suspension of surfactant molecules. Also, we have the PhD thesis of Fernando Torres, who studied nanostructure composite materials. More recently, there was a PhD thesis of Rosa D'Ambrosio, who used the spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, the near infrared, to design sensors and actuators made from nanotubes. And the last na PhD, which is currently uh, occurring in our lab, is that of uh, Luc Chavignon, who is working uh, to develop some biosensors and drug delivery. So before to go in this example of our work in our lab, I first introduce the structure of a single old nanotubes. So most of you may know that you can design a nanotube by cutting a ribbon from a graphene sheet. And when you cut this ribbon, the width of the ribbon will correspond to the diameter of the nanotubes, the perimeter of the nanotubes. So you have this keyhole vector, CH, which is a linear combination of the two unit vector of graphene. And this CH vector will correspond to the perimeter of the carbon nanotubes. So with two integers, n and m, you can design the perimeter, the diameter, and the symmetry of the nanotubes. And as most of you may know, uh, depending on the scale vector, you can have some metallic properties of semiconducting properties for these nanotubes. So then, should we speak about fluorescence or photoluminescence when we speak about light emission from nanotubes? The answer is that it actually depends on your community. So usually the chemist will talk about fluorescence because they will refer to light emission by molecules, which basically corresponds to excitation from a quad state to an excited state, non-radiative relaxation down to a relaxed excited state, and then emission of light that they call fluorescence. 
And on the other hand, the physicist will uh, describe a phenomenon which starts from an electron in the valence band, which is promoted by absorption of a photon to the um, uh, conducting band. Then there will be relaxation down to the gap, and then emission of the photon, which they will call photoluminescence. Usually, the chemist will describe the phenomenon as a function of wavelengths of exciting and emitted wave, and the physicist will measure the energy of the exciting and emitted photons. What about nanotubes? When you look at the electronic structure of the nanotubes, you both can identify some uh, bands, valence bands. Uh, Below and conduction band on the top, separated by a gap for semiconducting nanotubes. But you can also see these, um, these peaks in the density of states, these so called Van Hoff singularities, that remind you that nanotubes are a one dimensional system and that they also have this maxima of electronic density of states, which looks like what you have in a molecule. And actually, the optical properties of nanotubes are dominated by transition between this uh, singular, these symmetric pairs of singularities. So to describe the photoluminescence or fluorescence from the nanotubes, you will start from a state, a big state in the valence band. You will promote an energy, you will change of energy, you will go to the conduction uh, band by absorbing a photon, then you will have a non-radiative relaxation, and then a radiative relaxation uh, around the gap. Uh, one important point, one key point to be able to observe photoluminescence from nanotubes is to first separate the nanotubes in the bundles. So when you synthesize raw nanotubes, you usually don't synthesize one single nanotube, but you get this kind of nanocrystals that are called bundles where nanotubes are packed in a dense way on hexagonal arrays and nanotubes are interacting through van der Waals interactions and if you don't uh, break this interaction if you don't exfoliate the nanotube from the bundles then you may have some um, um, energy transfer uh, from the semiconducting to the metals. And when you got this energy transfer, you will observe some non radiative relaxation on the metallic states, on the continuous states of the metallic nanotubes. So, one key point to observe the emissions is first to break the bundles, to exfoliate the nanotubes from the bundles. And the first group who achieved it was the group of Weissmann in Rice University. Uh, in 2002, and they showed that to do that, you can use mechanical energy from sonication and then some surfactant to isolate the nanotubes and to prevent the re reaggregation. And when you are able to do that, if you excite an aqueous suspension of single nanotubes stabilized by surfactant in uh, using a visible light, you will be able to observe emission in the near infrared. And you will get this kind of photoluminescence excitation map where once again you will excite the luminescence in the visible or in the UV. You will observe the emission in the near infrared, about one micron, about one EV. And each of these peaks will correspond to a particular nanotube with given Nm, given diameter, and given, uh, given symmetry. So actually, uh, by uh, comparing this kind of photoluminescence excitation map and calculations, this is basic tight binding calculation, you can assign one by one these peaks to uh, different optical transition from the nanotubes. This is this kind of graph is called Katara plot from the name of the Japanese researcher who first uh, uh, plotted this data. And you can see that the transit energy, both from the gap and for the highest um, transitions, uh, depend on the diameter and also depend on the semiconductor or metallic state of the nanotubes. So these photoluminescence excitation maps have been first used widely to characterize the samples, because once again, you will be able to identify each nanotubes from its emission 
uh, peak and determine the diameter, the distribution of di diameter and distribution of KRL angle that you get in the sample. So this is typically the uh, photomisance map for um, uh, sample prepared by the IPCO uh, technique, where you have a distribution of nanotube diameter, typically between 0.7 and 1.2 nanometer. So now, if you want to go uh, further in the assignment, uh, you can uh, compare the experimental results that you got here, and you can observe that you have some kind of patterns corresponding to series of nanotubes uh, with uh, comparable diameter or comparable Kival angle. And as I said before, you can compare these patterns with pat the same patterns that you can observe from tight binding calculations. So on the bottom line, you have on the left hand side some experimental results, on the right hand side some time binding calculations, which plot the ratio of the frequency of the second excitation to the frequency of the first excitation as a function of the excitation wavelengths, and you can observe that the patterns that you observe are, qu are quite comparable. So the patterns are quite the same, which allow, you, which allow you to assign one by one uh, the experimental peak to given nanotubes. But on the other hand, if you look carefully, uh, the values, the quantitative value of the ratio, the ratio of energy, the ratio of uh, emitted and excited wavelengths are not the same. It's about two on average for the uh, theoretical, and it's about 1.7, 1.8 for the experimental. In the literature, this has been uh, named the ratio problem, and for a couple of years, people didn't really understand what was the origin of this ratio problem, until on one hand, some theorists, Kane and Mele in Philadelphia, and the group of Fed and Ivories in IBM, and on the other hand, some experimentalists, the group of Tony Hines in uh, Colombia, the group of Stephanie Reich and Christian Thompson in Berlin, uh, proposed that the uh, reason for this discrepancy is that the optical properties of nanotubes are actually due to exciton, which were not considered so far. So once again, this excitons corresponds to exciton whole pairs, and rather to describe the photoluminescence using electron transition, you now have to consider some uh, bound electron hole uh, pair states with corresponding excitonic states, which are, which are um, associated to each of these peak in the density of states, and which will um, be responsible for the different uh, optical transitions. So these excitons were quite unexpected by scientists, because for you, who, for those of you who are used to work with semiconducting materials, the excitons on bulk 3D uh, materials are usually observed at quite low temperature, because the exciton, their binding energy is quite small. Uh, with respect to the thermal energy, uh, which means that they will not be stable at room temperature. So normally you observe them only at low temperature. The, um, what is interesting with nanotube, what is very special with nanotube, is that their exciton binding energy is about a couple of hundred milli electron volts, so much larger than KT at room temperature, which explains why they are stable at room temperature. Another key property is that the exciton mean free pass, that is typically the distance where the, nanot where the exciton can diffuse before to relax, to, to split and relax, is about 200 nanometers, which is close to the typical size of the nanotubes, which means that the exciton will basically explore quite a long lens on the nanotubes and will be sensitive to defects and sometimes to the length of the nanotubes. Also, another key property is that electron hole distance, electron hole radius is about two nanometers, which is larger than the diameter of the nanotubes. And this dipole, the exciton dipole, will then be able to explore the dielectric environment, be sensitive to all the dipoles which will be around, 
the dielectric constant of the solvent to the uh, to the molecules which will be adsorbed on the surface, etc. So that's one key point that we will uh, take advantage of in uh, the different application that I will present you afterwards. I have also to state that the photoemissant quantum yield is quite low, about one weight percent. It's even lower if you are not able to break correctly the interaction between the nanotubes, because once again, you will have energy transfer to metallic tubes, which will quench the luminescence. But still, even if you break correctly, if you exfoliate correctly, the photoemissance quantum yield is still quite low because you, you have further uh, non-radiative uh, relaxation pathways. Um, yeah, and then in the, in the next uh, slide, in the, in the rest of the talk, I will show you how we can take advantage of the luminescent signal to um, study the exfoliation of the nanotubes and also to study the so-called dielectric environment, the presence of dipoles and at some molecule on the surface. So I will first take a couple of examples that I really like in the literature. So this first work by the group of uh, OMA in, uh, in Japan uh, shows uh, the influence of gas adsorption on the surface of the nanotubes on the luminescent signal. So this guy worked with suspended single wall nanotubes uh, on two silicon pillars that you can see here. So here you have only one uh, individual single wall nanotube suspended on quartz pillars. And uh, you start by, uh, by putting them into vacuum. And when you put them into vacuum, the emission wavelength is about uh, 11, uh, 15 uh, nanometers. And then you open the valve and you let the ethanol uh, go in. And you see that above a given pressure, you will start to switch shift the luminescence and this will be the signature of gas adsorption and the tubes. These dipoles formed by the gas molecule, the ethanol gas molecule, uh, will interact with the electron hole pair with the excitons and this will uh, lead to a photoluminescent redshift and as you can imagine this can be uh, used to design some sensors, some gas sensors, uh, gas optical Optical, center, optical sensors to, to detect gas. Another uh, publication, another study that I really like is the, the work by the group of Sophie Cambré in Antwerp. So they've been working a lot on uh, dispersing nanotubes in aqueous suspension using surfactant. And they have been demonstrating that if you sonicate the nanotube in water, uh, you will open them because you have some sp3 defect on the edge of the nanotubes and the sonication may lead to opening the nanotubes and when you open the nanotubes you will fill them with water so initially during the synthesis they will be full of gas and when you will break uh, the the edge when you will open the, the edge the water molecules will be able to fill in the nanotubes and this will be the, the this will be uh, detectable in photoluminescence you will have a significant downshift so once again a wet shift a shift of the photoluminescence to the near infrared of the emission light of fill nanotubes with respect to open nanotubes so this is due to a change in the dielectric contrast in the dielectric environment of the nanotubes between open um, empty and thin nanotubes the last example that i would uh, comment before to show what we do in our lab is this work by tobias sertel from germany uh, in this group they wanted to measure the intrinsic signature of nanotube dispersed in water and as I said before, uh, it's quite hard to disperse nanotube in water. It's not stable. They will aggregate. So if you want to do that, you can use the idea of the Acertel and collaborators. You can first disperse nanotube with surfactant. Then you can immobilize them by putting them, embedding them into a gel. I guess this is a saccharose gel. And once they are embedded, you can uh, use dialysis to remove the surfactant molecule. 
And when you will do that, you will switch from one state where nanotubes are surrounded by surfactant to one state when nanotubes are dispersed into water. And you will once again see a significant, significant redshift of the photoluminescence that is shown to be reversible. When you put the surfactant, you get a blue shift. When you remove the surfactant, you get a red shift. So once again, if you increase the dielectric constant around the nanotubes, when you go from uh, when you go from an environment where the nanotubes are uh, decorated by surfactants to an environment where they are mainly surrounded by water, you will observe a red shift and also a drop, a drop of the a decrease, a drop of the photoluminescence intensity. So in our group, we have been uh, working on using the photoluminescence signal to explore the local environment of the nanotubes and we have especially sh shown that we can use couple Raman photoluminescence spectrometer spectro spectroscopy uh, to to study these environments so we have developed a tool where we use uh, where, where we are sorry where we are able to measure at the same time the Raman and the luminescence for this we use uh, FT Raman Fourier transform Raman with an excitation light in the near infrared at 1064 nanometers corresponds to photo energy about 1.16 eV. So look at the three reference sample that we study in the lab. So uh, below you have uh, powder of nanotubes. So in the dry powder of nanotubes, you have nanocrystals of nanotubes uh, where you have both metallic and semiconducting. So you observe only a typical Raman spectrum. So in the typical Raman spectrum, you have a G band around 1600 wave numbers. You have the 2D band about 2500 wave numbers. You have the famous radial breathing modes, which corresponds to a radial motion in phase of all the carbon atoms and whose energy is inversely proportional to the diameter. So this mode for people who know Raman is uh, widely used to, to estimate the diameter of the nanotubes. But then when you disperse this dry powder in water using a dispersing agent, you will not only see the Raman, you will see the same G, 2D and RBM peaks, but in addition, you will observe these broad peaks which correspond to photoluminescence. And if you change from small molecule, small surfactant molecule, like sodium dodecyl sulfate that you can see here, to um, polyelectrolytes, so here this is some DNA uh, brains uh, which are used to disperse the nanotubes, you will observe some significant shift of the photoluminescence. And uh, this will be this will, be, this will be used to, to, to better understand the dielectric environment of the nanotube. So um, on this slide, I summarize what we usually uh, use now in our lab, the reference sample that we use in our lab. So on the left-hand side, surfactants, small molecules, either sodium dodecyl sulfate or bile salt, this kind of molecules that are known to be some of the most uh, effective um, molecules to disperse nanochips. So when you use this and you check um, you check calculation, uh, molecular dynamics calculation, uh, you can uh, expect that you form a dense array, a dense coating with the small molecules, which will uh, screen the interaction between nanotube and water. Uh, this is with this uh, dense coating and the screening of water that you have the main, the, the, the most important blue shift of the photoluminescence. So this is a blue spectra on this graph. And on the other hand, <clears throat> when you use polyelectrolytes, DNA or um, biocompatible polyelectrolyte, carboxymethyl cellulose, which both uh, lead to a loosey wrapping of uh, around the nanotubes. Then you observe nanotubes are uh, sensitive to water. So nanotubes are exposed to water. They are exposed to higher dielectric constants. And you observe a systematic redshift of the photoluminescence signal.
So uh, a basic way to, to see that is that the, the denser the coating, the larger the blue shift. The more loosey the coating, uh, the larger the interaction with water and the larger the photoluminescent redshift. What you observe in photoluminescence on the bottom graph, you can also observe in absorption spectroscopy. This is the top graph. So once again, uh, depending if you use bile salt and dense coating or polyectolide and loosey wrapping around the nanotubes, tubes, you will see either a blue shift or a red shift. So after this introduction, I will present a couple of um, examples of what we do in our lab. So I will basically talk about three PhD theses that we uh, advise in our lab, that of Fernando Torres Canas about nanocomposites, that of uh, Rosa D'Ambrosio, and also the contribution of uh, Thiago C. Rodre, who spent one year with us in the lab, who designed some sensors and actuators. And finally, that of uh, Luc Chavignon, who is working on uh, biosensing and drug delivery. So for these three um, works, my main collaborators from University of Montpellier CNRS are Dr. Christophe Blanc, Dr. Tifou, and Dr. May Maurice in my lab or in IBMM Montpellier. So let me first talk about the work of Fernando. So in the work of Fernando, the main goal was to uh, prepare and study uh, nanocomposites with uh, polymer matrix and nanotubes dispersed as individual. So the idea was to prepare multifunctional composites and especially luminescent composites. But when Fernando tried to disperse uh, high concentration of nanotubes in the polymers. It got this kind of fragile materials with uh, some mechanical breakings, which occurred with time. And we figured out that it was due to the recrystallization of the polymer, uh, the recrystallization of the surfactant, sorry. So the idea of Fernando was the, that to be able to prepare some high concentration uh, composites, composite with high concentration of nanotubes, it should first eliminate the surfactants. So the idea was to disperse with an efficient surfactant, for example, bile salt, then to uh, process an exchange, a replacement of the surfactant by the polymer at the surface of the nanotubes, and at the end to have a high, uh, highly concentrated uh, composite of nanotube in polymer. And to check that at each step of the preparation, you have a good dispersion of nanotubes. You can monitor the exchange by near infrared spectroscopy. So you have uh, three steps in the preparation of these composites. First, you disperse nanotubes in a surfactant, for example, bile salts. Then you mix with your polymer, and you can check what happens at the surface of the nanotubes by using near infrared spectroscopy. And at the end, you can um, run a dialysis. And when you run the dialysis, you will eliminate the small molecule and you will get uh, some nanotubes dispersed by the, the polymer. So in this study, we use hydrosoluble polymers, PVA and PVP. So here you can see uh, the evolution of the coupled Raman photoluminescent spectra. Uh, when you add different amounts of polymers, so when you start from the bottom, you have uh, you are dominated by the surfactant, and you actually have a photoluminescent spectrum, which is very close to the one you have when you use only bile salt. And then when you increase the amount of surfactant, you have a regime where you mainly uh, aggregate the nanotubes and you lose the signal. But then when you continue uh, adding some polymers, you start to have another profile. And this new spectroscopic profile is actually very close to what you have with nanotubes directly dispersed by PVA. Uh, what you show uh, with this evolution of the spectroscopic uh, signature is that you have a spontaneous exchange uh, on the surface of the nanotubes. Uh, an exchange of the bile salt by the PVA at, at high concentrations. 
Um, sorry. So let me show you another example. So this is the first part of the PhD thesis of Rosa D'Ambrosio. So Rosa D'Ambrosio came in our lab from Venezuela to uh, design and prepare some um, some uh, hybrid actuators made with nanotubes and uh, a smart polymer called PEDIPAM. And to do that, she first prepared some suspension of nanotubes with uh, SDS. And she observed that she wanted to have some uh, stable suspension of nanotubes with SDS. And she observed something which surprised us at the beginning is that when she prepared suspension using nanotube and SDS with a high concentration of SDS, the optical absorption spectra were actually really unstable. You can see on this range of temperature between 25 and 40 degrees that the, that the optical spectra is changing significantly. So in this optical spectra, each of these peaks corresponds to a given NM nanotube, a given diameter and cavality. And you, when you change a little bit the temperature, you can see quite significant change. Um, one, the, the, the interpretation of this, to interpret this, this you have to, to check calculations. So these are ab initio calculations from Tumala and collaborators. Uh, he didn't run some calculation as a function of temperature, but this guy and his group showed that the organization of the surfactant at the surface of the nanotubes is actually very sensitive to the diameter of the nanotubes. And then we interpret this change as a reorganization of the surfactant on the surface of the nanotube as a function of the temperature. So one possible application of this uh, sensitivity to temperature would be to disperse, uh, would be to, to, to design some uh, nanothermometers and to go further in the, in the study of such nanothermometers. We studied the same materials by photoluminescence. So what you can see is that when you change the temperature on these nanotube SDS suspensions, you also observe in luminescence some significant change. So you can see that the photoluminescence peak both shift and change in intensity. And uh, what you observe as a function of the temperature, you can also actually observe as a function of the laser power. So in this case, you will heat the nanotube only locally uh, by uh, absorption of the near infrared beam, uh, photothermal conversion. And so here the nanotubes are acting both as uh, photon absorbers and also detectors from the photoluminescent signal. So here on this graph, you can observe the similitude between the evolution of the photoluminescent signal as a function of temperature and the evolution of the photoluminescent signal as a function of the laser light. And you can see that there is a quite good analogy between these two series of graphs, which means that you can actually estimate the local temperature of the nanotubes heated under the laser beam from the evolution of the spectroscopic uh, signatures. So now we come back to the heart of the PhD thesis of Rosa. So she used the PENIPAM uh, polymer, PENIPAM microgels, to prepare, to prepare temperature responsive uh, hybrids. So these PENIPAM polymers are uh, thermosensitive. Uh, they actually uh, show a phase transition, a volume phase transition between a low temperature state where they are hydrophilic and you can form some uh, swelled microgel when you reticulate the polymer to uh, hydrophobic state when you go above 32 degrees. And uh, in the hydrophobic state, you will see a shrinking of the microgels. And this volume phase transition can be observed by eyes or by optical spectroscopy. And uh, the idea of uh, Rosa was to promote this phase transition by uh, preparing some hybrids with microgels and nanotubes, where once again, the nanotubes will act as an absorber, 
uh, photon absorber, uh, and which will hit the polymer by photothermal conversion. And we will expect to probe the phase transition from the, from the photoluminescence properties. So to check that we are actually able to promote the phase transition of the nanotube of the pedipam, sorry, by hitting the nanotubes, we design we designed a pump probe experiment. So in this pump probe experiment, you have a pump laser in the near infrared, which is used to hit the nanotubes. So the nanotubes will absorb the near infrared laser, hit by photothermal conversion the polymer around, and we will use a second laser, a green laser, a probe laser, to uh, check, to probe the, the state, and uh, by measuring the scatter light from the sample. So I show you some typical results on this graph. So this is the scatter light intensity from the probe as a function of the laser power of the pump. So when you work with nanotube aqueous dispersion alone, these are the, the yellow uh, points, you actually mainly observe no scattering, whatever the incident power of the pump. When you work with microgels alone, it's a little bit the same. You mainly don't have any influence on the, of the incident power on the scattering properties. But on the other hand, when you use this hybrid sample, nanotubes mixed with the microgel, you first observe a small increase of the scattered light intensity, and then above a given threshold, you observe a huge increase of the scattered light intensity. That we assign to the photo-induced volume phase transition of the, of the polymer, of the penipam. And uh, this makes a state that we actually prepared some penipam nanotube hybrid photoactuators, uh, which are able to change their, their shape as a function of the laser power. So we now want to know if we are able to detect this phase transition from the photoluminescence uh, properties from the photoluminescence signatures. So once again, we first studied the hybrids as a function of temperature. And when we heat the hybrids in an oven, we see some slight but significant change of the photoluminescence, which we assign to some change of the organization of the polymer around the nanotubes uh, below and above the volume phase transition. And now we, uh, on the second time, we try to um, hit the nanotubes using the laser power. So we use an infrared laser power to promote the volume phase transition around the nanotubes. And as you can see on this graph, we also see some very comparable change, and which show that we can also, on one hand, uh, hit the nanotubes and promote the phase transition with this infrared laser, but on the other hand, excite and observe the photoluminescence, which will be able to probe a surface change, change molecular change uh, of the at the surface of the nanotubes. Let me come to the last example I wanted to stress today. So this is a work of uh, Luc Chavignon, the PhD work of Luc Chavignon, who is actually working in our lab. And this is a work that we developed with two collaborators, two biochemist collaborators, Alvaro Somosa in IMDA Madrid and Ney Maurice at CNRS Montpellier. And in this work, we want to use uh, nanotubes, cellular nanotubes, as platform to design biosensors or drug delivery system for uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, so I won't tell you too much about uh, pancreas cancer, but I can say that it's one of the most deathly cancer, but, uh, one of the highest rate of this and one of the most difficult uh, concerns to, to be detected. So that's why we decided to work that with these two specialists. 
and I will show you uh, an example of uh, what happens on the spectroscopic signature of nanotubes when we adsorb some drug. So this is a drug called abenaciclib, which is already used in various kinds of cancers. This is the coupled Raman photomyosin spectrum. And you can see that this is the starting point, uh, the, the black spectrum. And when you start to expose nanotube to this drug, you can see that the spectrometric uh, signatures are changing significantly. So you see a strong increase of the, the photoluminescence intensity and a significant shift of the photoluminescence, which allows us to claim that you do have an adsorption of the drug molecules on the nanotubes. On the right hand side, I show you some calculations which are not achieved with abebaciclib, but with another molecule called doxorubicin. And these calculations show that depending on the way you adsorb the molecules, depending on the number of molecules that you adsorb, you will change the effective dielectric constant around the nanotubes, which is uh, expected reason for strong change in the photoluminescence spectra of the nanotubes. So we are currently working on that, but of course we will have to couple uh, some experiments with some calculations to go further in the interpretation of this data. So uh, this is the end of my talk. Let me summarize what we can learn from optical uh, measurements, from photoluminescence measurement, measurement in the near infrared. So uh, you can uh, remind that the optical properties of nanotubes are based on excitons, these electron hole pairs that have a quite high binding energy, much larger than the thermal energy at room temperature, with a quite long mean free path of the excitons will allow you to explore uh, defects and the length of the nanotubes. The photoluminescence quantum yield will be very sensitive to the way nanotubes are interacting between them in the bundles. And um, this will be uh, used to explore the dispersion of nanotubes in different media. So the main application, the most widely used application will be to characterize your sample of nanotubes to make some NM assignments to discuss how much the nanotube is exfoliated in different solvents or different matrices, and also to explore some subtle change in the dielectric environment. So you can imagine different sensors or actuators based on the optical properties. And because the excitation, the emission is in the infrared, uh, near infrared, this corresponds to the biological window which allow you to imagine different kinds of application, biosensing and drug delivery uh, in this biological window. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for any question. Oh, thank you, Eric. A very nice presentation, very interesting examples of the applications as well. So now we have the time for some questions from the audience. Let me check the chat. So, Professor Fabiano Bernardi, can you see the screen, Eric? Yeah, I can. Okay, so we have the, the question. Thank you for the nice talk. Regarding okay. the use of nanotubes as ethanol sensors due to redshift, did you believe it would be valid for other molecules as well? Would you expect the same effect for multi-wild carbon nanotubes? Okay, so hi, Fabiano, and thank you for your question. So, yes, it's clear that when you start from nanotubes dispersed in vacuum, uh, you have the most uh, blue shifted spectra that you can expect. And as soon as you will adsorb some molecules and you will form some dipoles on the surface of the nanotubes, you will expect a change in the photoluminescence, which will basically always be, uh, always be uh, an upshift. Um, for the, so whatever molecule you will adsorb on the surface, you, you you should be able to detect them. Then, of course, it's not very selective, so I, then there is no way of, uh, of knowing exactly what kind of molecule we, we will absorb. You can only uh, calculate 
the effective dielectric constant, the effective polarity of the, of the, of the molecules that you put on the surface. And about the question on multiple nanotubes, so the photoluminescence properties have been demonstrated and studied widely for single wall nanotubes and double wall nanotubes. For multiple nanotubes, as far as I know, it's much, much more complicated because often in uh, multiple nanotubes, you have both semi connecting and metals, and then you will quench the luminescence. And often in multiple, you have a mix of uh, various species. And so I never saw any convincing report on uh, luminescence from uh, multiple nanotubes. So if you want to do that properly, you have to work with uh, well uh, designed and well controlled nanotubes, and it will mainly be single wall and double wall. Okay, I think we have one more question. It's known that nanotubes can be used for growing metallic nanoparticles at the top of the nanotubes. Do you work, do you group work with this application too? So what I have to say is that actually when you grow nanotubes, you need a catalyst and the catalysts are usually metallic nanoparticles. So for most of the nanotubes that are grown, you do have some metallic nanoparticles which are embedded inside or at the extremities or at the end or between nanotubes. And people work hard to actually purify the nanotubes and eliminate these metallic nanoparticles. So if I understand well, Fabiano, you are uh, thinking on the contrary, how you can grow metallic nanoparticles for, from nanotubes. So uh, my first answer would be to, uh, to, would be to, to design depends on what metallic nanoparticle you can use, but the best idea would be to design the growth of the metallic nanoparticles during the growth of the nanotubes. So I don't know to what metal nanoparticle you think, but like for with iron, with cobalt, with nickel, uh, you can grow metallic nanoparticles during the growth of the nanotubes. And then if you want to do that afterwards, um, yeah, that's, that's clear that you can use the nanotube surface as a platform to go different kind of species. So for this, you would have to start with molecules and to reduce them. Uh, so we don't no, we don't work on that in my, in my lab, but in my lab, there are people like uh, Vincent Jourdain who are experts in growing nanotubes. And once again, they try to understand uh, how the growth of nanotube will change at the function of the metal that you will use, at the function of the diameter of the particle, of the metallic particles, at the function of pressure and temperature. And with that, you could probably answer your question and grow a different kind of metallic nanoparticle uh, on your nanotubes. Okay, I think we have one more question. Dr. Augusto Christman. Hi, Augusto. You showed the work on the photoactuator's microgel. Very interesting. What is the potential use of it from a practical point of view? What kind of device, of device could make use of it? So, thank you, Augusto, for your question. So, our first idea was to uh, be able to demonstrate that nanotubes can both act as photothermal converters, so absorb light and convert that into it and promote the phase transition of the polymer, and at the same time, act as uh, optical probes. So from their optical signal, uh, be able to detect this kind of, of change. Uh, what about the applications? So of course, we are thinking about application uh, in biology or health. So as you saw, this is a phase transition from a swell state to a shrink state. So you can imagine adsorbing some molecules and uh, um, you say, um, and diffuse them and uh, we lag them uh, from these movements. So you can imagine to, to stock some uh, molecules and use the movement to uh, carry and uh, deliver the molecules at a, at a given place. So this is something we are currently considering in, in the lab as well. Very interesting, very interesting. 
So that's uh, just a comment from Fabiano. He was, I think you was thinking of nickel nanoparticles. Okay, so if you think about nickels, there are plenty of groups starting from either thin fins of nickel or uh, nanoparticles of nickel to grow the nanotubes. So they use this nickel nanoparticles or nickel thin films as um, as uh, as uh, sorry as materials which will absorb. Uh, gaseous carbonase molecules, gaseous carbonate molecules. The gaseous carbonate molecule will adsorb on this metal, will diffuse in the metal, and this will be the starting point from the for the growth of the nanotubes. And at the end, when again you may find your nickel nanoparticles in your tubes. So once again, the specialist in my lab is Vincent Jourdain, and we have different groups of people working on that. And yes, nickel nanoparticles can be the starting point for growing nanotubes. Okay, let's see. Naira said hi. <laughs> hi, Naira. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, that's all. I think we don't we don't, don't have any questions. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for your talk. It's a very interesting subject. And our talks are all available on the Senanuk channel, so more people will be able to, to watch later. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank you again. And for all the, the listeners, so we have a, our next talk next month. I will send you the, the topic very soon. But for now, for today, that's it. So, Eric, it's late night, I think. Next, it's <laughs> late night in France. So, enjoy the rest of your night and for mm -hmm. all our students here in Brazil have a nice week uh, a nice evening and the transmission is done bye bye thank you very much Andre thank you to all of you bye bye have a nice day mm -hmm.